Matthew 28. So if you want to open your Bibles and join me there. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. And while you're getting that out, it's probably it's a good time to remind all of us that um, in February, on the first week of February, we're going to have a quarter of the week. Um, and disciples, being a disciple and making disciples is our theme, and that quarter retreat is a family retreat. So it'll be fun for kids, fun for the whole family, and we'd love to have you join us um, to kind of get away a little bit and take some time away from our normal life. Uh, so tomorrow is the last day that you can do the early bird sign up for that. Um, there are also some scholarships available uh, if you need some help financially, and that would be great just to let the office know. So um, we're going to begin reading at 28, 16 through 20. And now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus said, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. <coughs> As the ushers come forward, I'd like to share with you some verses from Psalm 86. Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, prayer O Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. Shall we pray? Lord God, we love you this morning and we praise you. We praise you for who you are and what you mean to us and what you continually do for us daily. We praise you, Lord, because you are a God who hears and a God who listens and a God who answers. We praise you, Lord, because you continue to meet our every need. Help us now as we give, Lord. Help us to consider this as an act of worship. Help us to know and help us to remember that you have called us to give and you've called us to serve. So help us to do it joyfully and generously, knowing that it pleases you. In your name we pray. Amen.
as we uh, as we come to pray this morning, I'm gonna um, just take a, a couple of moments just for us to think about for a second uh, where we are. And you might be like, "Well, I know where I am. I'm sitting in church and I'm doing my thing. I, no, I get that." But where really are we? Where are you? And as you have heard, hopefully at least a couple of times, and we're gonna. Uh, singing in just a moment we're on holy ground and 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 it's always been a weird um, phrase to me because there's nothing specifically especially amazing about the the floor that we're standing on right now it's similar to our altars as we think about our altars I mean really they're pieces of wood with some nice carpet on and but it's what happens in those places It's who we meet as we kneel and we stand on this holy ground. As we kneel before our Lord and Heavenly Father. As we we do those things. As we have an opportunity to come into His presence. I'd like you to, uh, if you would, just take your uh, bulletins uh, and take those out for me. Um, and I, we're going to add a couple of uh, names, um, which seems to uh, be a, a, a pretty regular thing we're doing right now. But I wanted to add a couple of names to uh, the list uh, of people that are on here. Uh, you'll want to uh, remember Mark Gallup. Uh, for some of you know, he's been having uh, some, some neck uh, challenges and uh, uh, got so bad yesterday with his neck and his back and everything else uh, that he had to go to the emergency room yesterday. And uh, so he's there right now as we're worshiping. Uh, he's, uh, he's there right now. So I, I, I'd ask you to put Mark Gallup on your uh, prayer requests. And then a couple of people specifically uh, to mention this week. Uh, one would be Margaret Beecham, who uh, had a hip uh, replacement, um, uh, like a half hip replacement uh, this week um, on Tuesday. So remember her as she recovers. Uh, as you would know, if you've been around, uh, anybody who's had to have that done is a long road to recovery. Um, it, it's just going to be in uh, rehab for at least a month and, and all the stuff that goes with that. So we're praying for Margaret as well as Gordy uh, being in separate places and, and Denise and, and Craig with all that, that they have um, to, to, to handle and to deal with uh, when it comes to those types of things. I also just wanted to, to mention um, uh, that it's nice to see Bob with us uh, this morning. Um, it's really great to see how the Lord continues to provide for us. And so, Bob, it's been great. We've been praying for you, and it's great to see you this morning. An answer to prayer, uh, a true answer to prayer, as I know this is your last week here before you head to to Florida and some others. Um, But what a great privilege that we have to to pray together. And so we're going to sing this verse together. We're standing on holy ground. Maybe you want to come and you want to kneel at this place. Maybe we want to come and kneel before the Father. Maybe you want to do that this morning and We'll have an opportunity as we sing to do that and then I'll close our time in prayer. But we're standing on holy ground in the presence of Jesus Christ, the great I Am. Let's sing together. We
I'm just going to take a couple of moments to pray for those that are in our influence. For those that are on our prayer request sheets in our bulletins. For those that right this morning just need a special touch. So I'm just going to invite you just the next couple of moments to pray together. To pray as a corporate body for those who need a special touch from the Lord this week. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you. We thank you for your presence amongst us. And Lord Jesus, we just praise you for who you are right now, right here. And that you, that you care for each of us and want to hear from us. And so Lord, as we have lifted our requests before you, we lift our praise before you. And Lord, as we stand, as we kneel, as we kneel on this holy ground, Lord, I pray that for all of those who need a special touch from you, whether in this place, whether further afield, whether listening online, or wherever it is, Lord, I pray that you will come and that you will be all that they need. Lord, I pray for uh, just the opportunity that we have and thank you for the opportunity that we have to come into this place. Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you would continue to speak to us you will continue to reveal yourself to us. Lord, thank you for this uh, amazing opportunity um, to come and to hear directly from your spirit. Lord, may we go from this place changed people because we've met with you. Lord, now be with us. Bless us in Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. I'm going to invite the children if they'd like to go uh, to their uh, worship together. And... Uh, we'll Well, good morning, everyone. Can anyone else smell lunch? I totally can, so maybe it's just right here. <laughs> that might work to my benefit or not, I'm not sure. All right. He doesn't want to miss the line. That was great. All right, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew 28. So Peter and I were at lunch uh, with a pastor friend earlier this week with him and his wife, and they're in another denomination. And, you know, when pastors get together for dinner, they always ask the question, oh, so what are you preaching on this Sunday? And uh, we don't get together that often, but probably, I don't know, maybe every other month, something like that. And I said, oh, this Sunday we're talking on discipleship. And he looks at me and goes, again? I said, yeah, again, we're going to keep talking about this until we all have it right. Hey, at least you laughed and you didn't groan, so that's a good sign. <laughs> yes, again, we're talking about discipleship over these next three weeks, and especially as we lead into the core retreat, we're going to have some significant time to do some personal application when it comes to discipleship at the core retreat. But so let me share this quote with you from Neil Cole, and he wrote a book called Search and Rescue. He says this, Ultimately, each church will be evaluated by only one thing, its disciples. Your church is only as good as its disciples. It does not matter how good your praise, your preaching, your programs, or your property are. If your disciples are passive, needy, consumerist, and not moving in the direction of radical obedience, your church is not good. Well, a little sucker punch to the face there. <laughs> But I don't know about you that when I read that, it really resonated with me. So why do we keep preaching about discipleship? Because discipleship is the outcome of radical obedience to Jesus. Being a disciple is the result of a transformed heart. 
It's the result of coming face to face with gospel and being changed. I heard a great story um, from another preacher this week and he used this illustration about a man came in late to church and afterwards he's like, he said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I was driving to church and I had to pull over, there was something wrong with my car and when I got pulled over, I got hit by a Mack truck. And the pastor's just looking at me like, really? <laughs> you don't look like you've been hit by a Mack truck. But think about this. If you had an encounter, a human being, with a giant truck on a freeway, you're going to look different. Well, Jesus Christ has more of an impact than a Mack truck. And if we do not look different when we come into an encounter with the gospel, into a relationship with Jesus Christ, then we need to start evaluating. How am I doing in my walk? Do I look different than the random person on the street? Have I had an encounter with Jesus Christ and has it changed me? Has it moved me into action? Because there's a beautiful thing that happens when you encounter Jesus Christ and when you move from being a believer to a disciple, you start moving into being a disciple maker and there's a change. There's fruit in how we live and there's evidence of that transformation. So let's start with a couple of de definitions. First, what is a disciple? So this is straight from the dictionary. You could probably quote this back to me. It's a follower or a student of a teacher, leader, or a philosopher. There are disciples who are not believers in Jesus Christ. There are disciples of other thoughts or philosophies. But it's a learner. And we want to keep in mind that in the Jewish and the Greek culture, so the context of what the Bible of the time it's written in, they would have understood this, whether it was secular or sacred. They would have understood this, this relationship between teacher and student. They would know that a teacher would train and mentor and teach and that the student would shape their thinking and their reasoning, and even their living to be modeled after the teacher. But this required two things for that teacher-student relationship. It required time and proximity. It's hard to learn if you're not spending time learning from the teacher. And this really, think about it, it requires relationship. It's a relationship where we follow, we learn from, we focus on the triune God when we're talking about Jesus Christ and Christianity. The essence of discipleship is relationship. It's not checking off the boxes and the things that you're supposed to do, but it's a relationship with the triune, triune God. Jesus models this for us over and over again in his life and ministry that we read through the Gospels. Not only in how he connected with the Father, that vertical connection, but how he connected with his intimate group of disciples and the masses. He shows us over and over again how to live, how to be. He knew how to fuel a relationship that pointed people to the Father. And friends, when someone confesses that they love Jesus and yet they don't have a vibrant, constant relationship with him, we see a different kind of Christian, which is probably very familiar to many of us. We find people who really, yeah, they believe in Jesus Christ, but they're not disciples. What's the difference here then between a disciple and a believer? A believer, a believer is someone who believes in Jesus, okay? <laughs> they believe. They may or may not attend church regularly. They may or may not study the Bible. They may or may not pray or give tithes or offerings and so on. They may or may not have said a specific prayer at a specific time asking Jesus to save them. A believer believes in Jesus, but they may or may not have allowed Jesus and the Holy Spirit to transform them. 
There are a lot of people who live in this world who believe in Jesus. In fact, they claim him as their, their savior. They put bumper stickers on their car. They, they go to Christian functions and they support Christian events and they profess faith, but they don't look any more like Jesus than the first day they said, will you be my savior? They don't look any more like Jesus. When it comes to discipleship, uh, William Barclay says this. He says, it's possible to be a follower of Jesus without being a disciple. To be a camp follower without being a soldier of the king. To be a hanger-on in some great work without pulling one's weight. Once someone was talking to a great scholar about a younger man, he said, so-and-so tells me that he was one of your students. And the teacher answered devastatingly, He may have attended my lectures, but he was not one of my students. It's one of the supreme handicaps of the church that in it there are so many distant followers of Jesus and so few real disciples. A disciple is someone who is fully committed who, who is committed to obeying Jesus in every part of their life. And not just having Jesus as a part of their life, but living in a way that Jesus is their life. Disciple means, remember, learner. And in the New Testament, you know what these learners did, these disciples, they gave up everything they had in order to follow the master. And friends, a disciple is what Jesus has called us to become. It says in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And Luke 14, 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Friends, the first challenge for you today is, are you a believer or a disciple? Look at Matthew 28, 16 through 28. These are some of Jesus' very last words to his followers. And really, it's his vision for those of us who love him Matthew 28, 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So look at this verse 16. First he does something here in these last words. He reminds us that he has the authority to tell us what to do. I think one of the reasons young people want to grow up so badly is they want to have the authority for, to tell themselves what to do. Right? They don't want anyone else to tell them what to do. But Jesus reminds us here that he has the authority to cast the vision. He says, believer, follower, remember this. I have the authority in heaven and in earth. Friends, he's the son of God who was there at the very beginning of the world. At creation. Now, take a second and just quickly in your memory and your thoughts, everything you know about the Bible and the New Testament, think of all the incredible things that Jesus did in just three short years of ministry. He demonstrated his authority over nature when he calmed the storm. He showed his authority over matter and cells when he said the crippled person to be healed. He showed his authority over the spiritual realm when he would cast out demons who recognized him for who he was. Friends, he demonstrated his authority when he beat death and defeated Satan. He has the authority. This is someone with the power and the knowledge and the experience 
to follow. Remember who this rabbi is. He's a son of God, born to a virgin who was sinless, was fully God and fully man, who was the perfect sacrifice for all of humanity, for you, that your sins could be redeemed and that you can be reconciled to God. I wonder if it would be that simple this morning that someone just needs to be reminded that Jesus has the authority And because of that, you can and you need to choose the path of being a disciple, to move past that seat of believing and doing nothing else, but to move into a relationship of discipleship where you are ready and willing to grow and mature as a learner. Jesus reminds his followers of his authority And he gives these final instructions. He says, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. Now, when you hear that great commission, this command, this mandate from Jesus, maybe you have a roadblock up because of the very first word, go. You are comfortable right where you are. I don't want to go anywhere. You know, I can really relate to this. (laughs) There have been a lot of times in my life where I have had to go, where I've been sent. And frankly, there's been times where I've been told to go and I don't want to go. Royal Oak, Michigan. (laughs) And you know what I've learned when he says go When you are obedient, he will bless you more than you could ever imagine. And in every moment that I've personally responded to God's urging to go, whether that's moving to new cities or whether that is reprioritizing what I'm doing in a particular day, God's way is always better. Remember, a disciple follows and focuses on the master's will, not their own. And I do want to share with you this other point about this this Greek word here for go. It can also be translated as going or as you go. So think about that. If read the verse like this, then as you go, make disciples of all the nations. Meaning, in everything you do, as you go throughout your day, your regular sort of day. Make disciples. We know in 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says, in all you do, whether what you're eating or drinking, do it for the glory of God. So don't be scared away by this word go. He's not necessarily sending you to Kenya, although that is a great opportunity. He might just be reminding you today, as you wake up, as you go to work, as you take care of your family, make disciples disciples. Think about that. Think about how you would act differently or speak differently if you're thinking about everything that you're doing is an action of disciple making. If you are a parent, you are making disciples. What kind of disciple you're making definitely could be questioned. As we live, we are called to make disciples. Now, and this is a tricky thing. Well, how do you make disciples? It's so easy to want to cling to a formula or do a specific thing or follow a curriculum or read a book. But there's so many different ways in how the fruit gets produced in making disciples. And we're going to answer this question over the next few weeks, and especially at the core retreat when we gather. We're going to work on individual plans of how to be a disciple maker. But when you think about making disciples, take away all the to-do out of it and just hear this. If you are a disciple, it is natural fruit that you would be making a disciple surely by living as a follower who is committed to learning from Jesus Christ. Remember what that definition is. A disciple is a learner 
a student who's in a relationship with their teacher, who learns how to share the message, how to live a life that gives glory to God. Friends, we make disciples by following Jesus and sharing what we learn with others. I have a fantastic new tagline for discipleship. I feel like I need to copyright it. Instead of go into the world and make disciples, it could be translated, as you go, share what you know. (laughs) Okay, I know it's cheesy. Thank you for the pity laugh. (laughs) I appreciate that. All kidding aside, Do you know what happens when you share your testimony about what God is doing in your life? Other people are like, well, I want some of that Jesus. I want to know what what it's like to live without shame. I want to know what it's like to experience grace and peace and comfort and joy. I, I want to know this thing called salvation. And I think it's interesting. I It's by no accident that in this command, Jesus says, go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The history and the act of baptizing was and is, it's a public exclamation, a a demonstration of the inward work of what Christ has done. Now, most of you in this room would probably already know that the Salvation Army does not practice baptism, but that does not mean we're not participating in the Great Commission. We believe that in that moment of conversion, when we are baptized by the Holy Spirit, we are made new and clean and pure. And we also believe in the public declaration of that inward work. It's called testimony. It's speaking of the truth of what Christ has done. No water, no problem. Say what Jesus has done. Live in a way, speak in a way, share the good news of that inward cleansing and transformation. The point of disciple making, yes, is to, con- to convert, it's to proclaim. And finally, look at the end part of that verse. In verse 20, it's to teach them to obey. Too often in our efforts to evangelize the world, to tell people about Jesus, we invite them to have this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and then they convert, and we kind of leave them dangling. With not enough encouragement, or maybe with insufficient resources of how to develop their relationship with Christ, or maybe even an inadequate relationship with other believers. Disciple-making is a community event. We have a relationship with Christ, and we connect with others to grow and mature in our faith. Verse 20 says, Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. Another word they've used, and we heard it when Rochelle read from her translation, it's to observe all the commands I've given you. Honestly, I I prefer the word obey because it makes it clear that following Jesus was, it wasn't optional. It requires a response of obedience. Friends, we need to remind one another that this final part of the command, this obedience piece, it involves a lifetime of following and learning from Christ. Do you know, Jesus gives more than 400 commands in the Gospels, and more than half of them have to do with disciple-making commands. Becoming a disciple of Jesus does not mean completing a curriculum, or attending church and having a perfect attendance record, or going to every single activity that's ever in the bulletin. Although I do like it when you show up. (laughs) But it is about choosing a lifestyle. How will you live? How will you be identified? How will you respond? Will you let the Holy Spirit transform you to be more like Jesus. The best part of this 
grand vision that Jesus has set for us in Matthew 28 is found at the end of verse 20. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Christ is with us. He is with us. He is for you. He is not a teacher who will leave you stranded without support or kindness or goodness or guidance. He is with us. He loves you so much. Friends, are you his disciple? I want to read from, for you from John chapter 17. And this portion of scripture is red letter scripture, the very words of Jesus. And this is his prayer. He knows that he is about to be arrested, will soon be tortured and crucified. He knows he's about to take on the sins of the world. And we have this peek into his prayer to the Father, his connection to the Father. I want to invite you to close your eyes and listen to you as I read this. These are the very words of Jesus. Father, I'm coming to you now. But I say these things while I'm still in the world so that, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they're not of the world any more than I am of the world. Father, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They're not of the world, even as I am not of it. Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, Father, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Dad, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. Father, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. Father, I've made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Friends, Jesus loves you so much. He loves you so much before you were ever born. The Father, the triune God, knew you and he knew there was a purpose for you to live as redeemed and transformed, to be unshackled by the bounds of sin, to know him and to be unified with other believers. We have one mission, we have one vision, and it is to be disciples who make disciples.
that singular vision to follow Jesus. Friends, the challenge today is simple. Are you a disciple? Or have you been comfortably sitting in your believer chair? Really not letting this Jesus Savior penetrate any other area of your life. You just keep your Christian belief box over here so you don't offend anybody else. Well, that is not a disciple. And the second question is, are you a disciple maker? Are you mentoring? Are you leading? Are you bringing along? Are you journeying with others as they grow in maturity? Are you a disciple maker? Prove it. There are too many nominal fence-sitting Christians. People who know about Jesus but who have never been in relationship with him. And that breaks my heart. One of my deepest fears is that my, chi- my children would know about Jesus but they wouldn't know him. One of my deepest worries is that you would know about Jesus, but that you wouldn't know him. Are you a disciple? And you know, in those references to Matthew and Luke earlier, being a disciple is not easy. There are certainly challenges, because you better believe disciples are in the minority in our world. You're going to be a follower of Jesus? The world will not recognize you. Jesus said that in his prayer. They're not of this world, but Father, I don't want to take them out of the world, but would you please protect them from the evil one? That's the Lord's prayer for you. He's with us to the very end of the age to walk with us and to guide us. But will you choose to be a disciple? Will you follow him and follow him alone? Or will you sit in your believer chair with your back turned to the Christ? There's a beautiful song called If Crosses Come. And the chorus reminds us not to turn back, to stay with our mind and our heart set on Christ, to follow our Lord. Whatever it may cost, will you live to be a disciple who makes disciples, to save, to bring along the lost? I'm going to ask Rochelle to pray, and I want you to know the altars are open. Maybe your prayer this morning is Lord, I want to be a disciple. I want to move out of just believing. I want to follow you. I want my life to be different. I want to look different so people know that I've encountered Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm a disciple maker. I mean, I love Jesus. I feel like I'm growing and I'm following him and I'm walking with him. But am am I bringing anyone else along? Well, maybe you need to say, Lord, reveal to me who I am. I need to talk to. Why is it weird for us to talk about spiritual things, to talk about the Bible when we're out at lunch or when we're catching up with a friend on the phone? We have to make this more common. Let us be disciple makers, encouraging one another and bringing each other along. And maybe your prayer this morning is, Lord, help me identify my next step. We all need to take a next step. Whether today you're going to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior for the very first time. Maybe you're, oh, he died for me? That I could be saved? Yes. Maybe you just need the Lord to open your eyes to how to order your day. As you go, how will you make disciples? It's t-
too easy to turn back to what is comfortable. Friends, I challenge you today to actively be a disciple who is making disciples. Let's take time to pray together. Heavenly Father, you are holy, and I am in awe of the idea that you love us, that your son Jesus loved us even before we were known. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today. Lord, that they would be challenged to grow and to know you in a powerful way that would change them. That they would seek after your word in a way not to gain knowledge, but to be transformed by your word. To know you more, to know you in a greater way. And Lord, that that passion would just seep out to the community that we would encourage one another and be excited about what you're doing. Not in a competition to see who knows more, but in a relationship to celebrate what you're doing. God, we wanna be disciples who are making disciples. I pray that you would make it clear, specific names of people who need to know your changing grace and that you would give us the courage to speak up, to reach out and to bring others along. Lord, I pray this for the youngest members of our congregation to the oldest, that we would be more than believers, but that we would be disciples who are committed to learning, to loving and to knowing you. Lord, I pray that your power would come in this place and you would transform us, that you would transform this place and the reach and the influence that you would be known. God, we love you so much. We love you and I pray that you give us the courage to follow, to not turn back, but to follow. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand, and let's sing this song as our benediction today. We'll start with the verses.
Father, we love you, and I pray that you would be with us as we go, as you've promised. Lord, thank you for your grace and your abundant love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today, and we look forward to seeing you in the gym for lunch.